right, so we're talking about some polymer failure analysis and um, gonna kind of show a video of a recurring polymer failure that's been uh, the bane of my existence for uh, some months now. And it takes a lot of time to fix. And uh, so I'll kind of show you that, that video right now. Talking about failure analysis, and uh, this is an example of failure analysis done to a processing problem. And uh, this has really been the bane of my existence. So you see that little groove there in this PVC pipe um, that I, I had in my two inch PVC pipe um, that I had in my uh, front yard there. And uh, it's led to uh, several leaks because this is uh, probably a problem with the processing equipment. And so this little defect shows up every so often on the length of the pipe and it ends up being a weak point and you just think about hoop stress and uh, so i start getting uh, longitudinal cracks and it leads to leaks and i'll kind of show you a picture of the uh the carnage that this leads to but but stuff like this uh lately been the bane of my life um it uh falls definitely in the category of polymer failure analysis but this is uh uh, failure caused by the actual processing and in, in extruding the pipe. All right, so we saw the video and uh, the picture here. Let me get my fancy laser pointer. Do 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 do. My uh, this is a little blurry, I think, because I was like shaking with anger because this was the first one actually, and you kind of see the water gurgling to the top. Um, I've may have mentioned it before i live in kind of a rural area i have a rural property and uh, so there's a a pipe um that a previous owner of the property i i uh, reside in um, put in kind of an auxiliary line i think uh to uh have more hose spigots which was was kind of interesting i guess they couldn't buy a longer hose at home depot or whatever and uh, they actually used a pretty poor quality pipe and uh, you saw the defect and so this is kind of the result of some polymer failure and you know, we water girdled here. This one was worse, but it's all the same pipe at different points. And it's that recurring defect um, from extruding the pipe, actually extruding that PVC pipe. Uh, I got this figure from this book, Atlas of Polymer Structures. And uh, this kind of talks about um, the anatomy of a failure. And so this is a tensile specimen um, you kind of get this kind of, they call it the microplastic zone. And I'm going to show this figure and I'm going to show another figure. And uh, I kind of think both of these on their own are incomplete. So this figure and the figure I'm going to show next. Um, if you put the figures together, I think it kind of gives a, a better um, example of, of what's happening when... Um, um, polymers fail basically and so this is a dog bone tensile specimen a little schematic um, we start getting this kind of this stretching of the uh, molecules stretching of the polymer chains actually then you get chain scission and many things can cause chain scission uh, moisture can actually cause chain scission so it's important to keep uh, at least raw polymers dry and uh, because that can lead to a definite um, problem in terms of mechanical strength. Um, one terminology um, that I want you to kind of pay attention to is crazes. So you start having these craze cracks forming and crazing is uh, really um, kind of important. It's important to grasp. Um, anytime you bend a polymer and you see white, um, that's called strain whitening. And uh, that's due to a bunch of craze cracks. And we'll see kind of an example um, here later on uh, but we start cutting the formation of these crazes uh, this here um, i'm gonna kind of kill my own reveal um, when you start seeing these these kind of void so this empty space is void uh, where you see these kind of lines here these elongated polymer chains is actually elongated polymer chains those are called fibrils um, actually and uh, fibrillation is kind of a, a, a big deal um, we start shearing, uh, seeing shearing. I'm reading the, the slide, so I kind of messed up a little bit. Um, you start having kind of movement of the polymer change that forms what's called shear bands. And uh, these are actually kind of hard to see um, on a, through microscopy. And then when you're starting to get necking, 
um, this is kind of nearing failure and rupture and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know why it kind of shows almost a rough, a ruptured, um, area. Then it kind of shows necking here. So when you have necking, you have a lot of crazing. And then a lot of times when you look at a tensile test, uh, you'll see, you know, kind of some white, um, due to the craze cracks. And then you get, you get final rupture and, I don't think this is the most complete figure, uh, no bash to, um, to this author, but let's see this next slide. So I kind of like this this figure a little better. Um, it's missing a lot of stuff though. It's missing craze cracking and, and the shear band formation, um, but I kind of like it because it shows it in reference to a stress strain curve. And a lot of times you get kind of this yield hump and then you still get drawing and uh, you still have this um, elongation happening. Um, and the necking here isn't quite as dramatically depicted. Uh, I had a student draw this uh, some time ago, um, but the necking is due to actually the chains elongating and finally, finally they break. And so we're gonna see um, several examples of, uh, of this um, throughout uh, this particular lecture. Um, this is kind of a cool uh, figure. Um, I really like it. And uh, you always learn about defects and defects related to um, the formation of cracks and, and leading to failure, uh, particularly if you've taken failure analysis and um, pretty much just stress concentrators um, is, is what they end up being. And I kind of like, um, they've kind of categorized it in two phases, um, super macular and, and, and macro, macro molecular. Um, defects and supermolecular, excuse me, supermolecular and macromolecular defects and um, kind of these different things. And some of these things we've actually kind of talked about and um, phase separation. So I've shown you uh, micrographs of, uh, of, of, of polymer phases. A microvoid is, is pretty much just a hole. Um, if you have a composite and we've talked about this too, um, the interfacial adhesion of uh, your filler material with your polymer matrix is extremely, extremely important. But other stuff that, you, that has, this, this I would kind of call pretty obvious, the presence of a void, the presence of a filler material, um, maybe even phase separation is pretty um, obvious, right? That's kind of general failure things. But other stuff you don't really think about is a crystallized domain. So we talked about crystallinity and polymers in a previous lecture. And um, we see that the entire polymer structure is not crystalline. Um, it's crystalline in certain spots. We have these other uh, crystallite structures that we've talked about called spherulites. And uh, so we kind of have this um, represented by what doesn't really look like a spherulite, unfortunately. This little arm here kind of looks more like a spherulite. But anyway, things that aren't quite as obvious. So the interface between the crystalline and amorphous region um, on kind of a grander scale. Here it's kind of showing it, um, cause what I said, when the polymer chains fold, you have a crystalline structure altered with a, uh, an amorphous kind of structure within your polymer, your, the holistic polymer structure. Um, other things that, you know, maybe you would never think about, you know, the end of the polymer chain. So we have this kind of bowl of spaghetti type of model where that polymer chain ends could also be a weak point um, within your structure. Um, chain entanglement is generally good. It tends to resist um, deformation, if you will. But if that entanglement is weak, uh, you have some problems there from a failure point of view. An overstressed bond, so this would be like a crosslink, um, and we also have weak crosslinking too. So overstress, so putting too much stress on your crosslink, and uh, having your crosslinks not be strong enough um, could also lead to a polymer failure. And the strength reducing uh, mechanism overall. And then in your crystalline domain, if you have some sort of defect in your folded polymer chain, that's another. Um, area where uh, the strength of your material could be compromised. And so think of these things um, in terms of the defects within a polymer structure leading to the overall failure of your, your polymer structure. Um, I kind of like this figure as well. And again, I've borrowed it um, from this book, uh, Mitchler, um, Atlas of Polymer Structures. And it, it's actually kind of cool. So um, it kind of shows kind of the schematic representation of how um, things uh, look 
and different types of uh, more fracture morphologies, if you will. And uh, I've written uh, quite a few papers myself and my students um, on, on different uh, failure analysis situations for polymers. And I'll share with you uh, some of the figures here. Um, again, this isn't meant to be a uh, end-all be-all uh, course on polymer failure analysis. This is one small lecture um, in the greater class, but hopefully this kind of whets your appetite um, to kind of look further into it. And uh, maybe if you've seen stuff like um, failure analysis and our polymer failure analysis and the course failure analysis uh, offered by our department, um, you can kind of correlate what I'm saying with uh, what, what that instructor, um, Dr. Stafford, um, um, says in, in his course as well. Uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of cool. So, you know, large defects, um, you know, demixing structures interfaces. So demixing structure would mean if you have like a polymer blend and it starts to kind of come apart. Um, the interface again, matrix composite, um, matrix filler interface um, is what I'm talking about there. Uh, deformation mechanism. So if it's brittle, is it ductile? Um, I'll kind of give you a little um, um, kind of preview. Um, if it's brittle, it generally doesn't have that much plastic deformation visible on the fracture surface. If it's ductile, um, there are there is a large amount of uh, plastic deformation. Um, secondary crack, so if it's a loaded um, type of uh, structure, you can also get like secondary cracks. You also see secondary cracks in a, a tensile test failure as well. Um, dynamic loading slash uh, fatigue. So you see striations. So we see fatigue striations when we do failure analysis of metal as well. And we see that here in uh, polymers. And uh, again, I'll show you uh, some examples of uh, these fracture morphologies and these fracture surfaces. Um, kind of the first thing I want to kind of harp on a lot is the difference between brittle and ductile failure. Um, we see craze cracking a lot um, when we have a brittle failure. And I would almost call this one a little bit of a mixed mode failure. Um, this is ABS, uh, a fracture surface of ABS, acryl nitrile butane styrene, uh, the same material that Legos are made out of. And uh, you see um, these kind of ridges, these are opened up craze cracks. And we'll see a little bit more of a schematic of, uh, of craze cracking um, here in a moment. Um, but there's not a whole lot of plastic deformation. And I know the scale bar isn't the same between these two. This is actually, um, well, I have to actually do a little bit of math. It's actually pretty close. So, but it's not the same, it's not the same scale, um, but it's not really that far off either. It's not an order of magnitude difference. Um, this is a rubberized blend and you see there's a lot more plastic deformation here on, a, on this one that I'm kind of highlighting with my laser pointer. And you see these kind of structures, they almost look you know, like gum or something. I, I, almost, I almost need to find a better uh, descriptor. But you see these, this is fibrils. And uh, the thing I need to kind of point out is that craze cracks have fibrils too, they're just smaller. Uh, when you see fibril, fibrillation on this kind of grander scale, that's, that's associated with um, um, a large amount of plastic deformation. And we generally associate a fibril heavy uh, um, fracture surface uh, with a ductile failure. And here's kind of another example. So this is in a really brittle material. Um, you can see it's a lot smoother of a fracture surface. Um, again, you know, not necessarily the same mag, um, but um, we see this crack here. And so this would be like a, a secondary crack because the um, what we're looking at parallel to the screen is the actual fracture surface, but we see craze cracks going into the screen and those would be secondary cracks. And within these secondary cracks, you see fibrils. And I wish it was a, a little bit higher uh, magnification um, because you can kind of see that the fibrils kind of have a repeating unit to them as well, which is kind of cool because the material is being drawn and, and stressed in them. Um, the materials holding on for dear life. So your polymer chains are actually elongating and that's what the formation of a fibril is. And I kind of alluded to that earlier um, in this lecture. Um, when we see a brittle fracture surface, um, this is kind of a classic brittle fracture surface. So this is polycarbonate. Uh, this material here, 
Um, I don't quite remember what it is actually. I'm pretty sure it says also polycarbonate, but from a different project. Um, but we kind of see these kind of classical structures and you see this on ceramic failures as well, the so-called mirror mist and hackle zone. So the mirror zone is generally pretty um, smooth. You have this mist region, which I've kind of highlighted in another mist region here, and uh, which looks uh, in some ways, a lot of times it looks like mist, like you sprayed a mist onto a, a mirror or something. And then you have the hackle and the, these marks are hackle marks and they kind of tell you, um, knowing the relation of these kind of tells you where the crack grew from. And this is a, a 3D printed structure, an additively manufactured structure, um, FDM type process. Um, and I'll show kind of a lot of uh, FDM type processes um, or images from FDM fabricated materials um, in this lecture as well. But uh, mirror mist and hackle, uh, generally fracture characteristics that we associate with a brittle fracture. And um, it looks like there was a lot of uh, plastic deformation um, at first glance, but really when you look, these are just uh, defects from the printing. So we didn't do that good of a job uh, printing this. And so this is um, one raster layer, and I don't quite remember what the pattern is, but this is one raster layer, another raster layer, and you see there's fracture surfaces, um, crack propagation zones, if you will, on each raster layer. So it's kind of cool, actually, if you think about it that way, because this one propagated this way. Um, we have a mirror zone, we have a mist region, and then we see the hackle marks. So we know this one propagated this way. So it's propagating mirror, mist, hackle in that order. Mirror, mist, hackle in that order. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. So 3D printing structure, different fracture surfaces, but we're seeing cracks that are propagated in many different directions. It's, it's really kind of a cool thing. I, I look at these um, quite often and uh, quite happy when I do. Um, kind of looking um, again at a ductile um, failure, and this is a, these are rubberized uh, blends basically. So I, I, you expect them to be ductile, right? You associate a rubber band, something stretchy, that's pretty ductile. And um, anywho, so you can really see, and I kind of tried in the figure and, and I'm looking back, I look back at my old articles sometimes, I'm, I'm almost disappointed with myself sometimes because I probably should have used uh, white as a color here to highlight it a little bit, probably would have stood out a little better. And if you look really closely, you see these uh, black arrows and the black arrows are pointing at fibrils basically. And this is a blown up region of this area here. So try to get a better view of the fibrils. Um, this was uh, off that old uh, Hitachi tabletop TEM, not at TEM, SEM, excuse me. So not the best instrument, but not the worst instrument um, either. But anyway, fibrils, look at that. Very nice. Ductile, lots of plastic deformation, big fibrils. Um, this is brittle, not very much plastic deformation to the point where you even see mirror mist and hackle. And we usually associate these fracture surfaces with like glass or, or another ceramic, that kind of thing. Um, here's kind of another example. So we're kind of, we're comparing a ductile brittle. Um, these are both 3D printed structures. This is one, uh, one layer and another layer. And the layers actually suck together pretty well. So we have kind of this strain induced uh, delamination. And uh, so we're kind of seeing these fibrils holding them together. So that's actually kind of cool. Um, here, uh, this is um, an actually a ceramic loaded um, polymer. And we're kind of seeing that the um, inner layer defects are actually playing a bigger role in the failure of, um, of this. Um, structure, this test specimen, if you will, uh, than the reinforcing element. So I don't see that big a sign that this um, filler material played that much of a role in the failure of, uh, of this as compared to what I see in terms of the inner layer um, defects. Here's an example of where we know our additive uh, was causing or actually contributing greatly to the failure. Um, this was a bad attempt actually by me to uh, incorporate graphene oxide into a material. And you kind of see, um, and there's actually a, a bit of deformation associated with this, but anytime you see something circular um, on a fracture surface like this, uh, this is a strain field. And uh, the um, 
particle here, this GO particle, it, it, it agglomerated basically, agglomerated graphene oxide, um, led to a stress concentration to the point where it actually formed a, uh, a stress field. And you see uh, kind of these secondary stress fields even forming here. And they're generally spherical. So if I hadn't opened this, um, it would uh, be pretty spherical. Um, if you've ever taken like, like scotch tape, cellophane tape, and then kind of put it down and peeled it off and looked, you kind of see almost like circles on it. So try that. I, I should probably try it um, on camera here and uh, maybe I will try to throw it in. If not, you know I failed in my home experiment because um, I'm putting it here on video. But um, strain filled, so kind of keep that in mind too. This is another fracture surface um, um, feature that you kind of want to play in mind. It's really kind of cool, um, really neat. You kind of see the manifestation um, energy was trying to be lowered. You made, made something spherical. And you even see it here. There's something else kind of sticking out here, but you almost see kind of this spherical structure or circular structure uh, around it. And uh, don't see much plastic deformation um, here. Um, so I would kind of say this is maybe, uh, well, this looks pretty plasticky. So I would kind of say this is a mixed mode ductile brittle um, fracture, but it was general, definitely aided by, uh, in fact, we see two kind of intersecting um, st stress builds um, here. And uh, they're due to the stress concentration of uh, this filler material. So we didn't do a good job uh, making this composite. I'm kind of showing the effect of uh, adding rubber. And I've shown this before. And it's, uh, I'm missing the source this time. I apologize. Um, this is just ABS. And so we kind of see this kind of um, brittle mode failure when we start adding uh, rubber to it. So this is a malic and hydride grafted SEBS. Uh, we start adding rubber to it at different um, levels. Uh, we see an increased amount of a plastic deformation, but then we get here and it doesn't quite look like there's as much plastic deformation going on. And we even see those look like strain fields there too, which is, a, or stress fields, excuse me. Too. And uh, so what's going on here is actually kind of interesting. And I kind of messed up the figure a little bit because I don't have my scale, but we're, uh, 1500 elongation is this one. So it elongated quite a bit. So that hopefully gives a clue to what actually happened. Um, so for this heavily loaded um, SEBS material, or heav heavily rubberized material, in fact, it was 90% rubber, basically. Um, we necked it so much. And so the uh, what basically happened was the cross section was, effect it was effectively reduced and um, um, you ended up with more of a planar fracture surface. So you don't really appreciate the plastic deformation that occurred uh, before this material ruptured. And so always kind of be aware um, that, that uh, sometimes it may look like a brittle failure, but it was really a, a very, very ductile material. And uh, so kind of interesting. I made some mistakes here on this slide, trying to figure that out. Looking uh, here, I got this from Engineering Dog or Engineer Dog. Um, I tried to make my own pictures of st of, uh, of stress whitening, and I really just couldn't. And uh, these, this is a three D printed structure actually, and um, so it was kind of fitting because I, I tend to talk about three D printed structures quite a bit uh, when I talk about uh, failure analysis and composites and stuff like that because I do a lot of that uh, myself. And uh, you see here, it was a red material. And uh, it, it was uh, broken and it wasn't a tensile test specimen. It was like a disc that they broke. And you can, if you're interested, you can kind of look at this URL. Um, but this is um, strain whitening basically is uh, what this is called. And uh, this course actually exists uh, because of strain whitening. And uh, there's kind of a longer story associated with that. I may tell you somebody at another time. Um, but anyway, uh, strain whitening associated with craze cracking. Again, here's kind of a schematic of, a, of kind of the craze formation, and then you it actually ruptures. So these um, chains will eventually break. Um, there is some elongation going on of the polymer chain, so you kind of get these micro micro fibrils, if you will. Um, these bigger fibrils, I tend to refer to them as macro fibrils. Um, they're a little bit bigger. 
um, than um, something on on almost a molecular level, really, because it's an individual polymer chain that's stretching out. Um, craze cracks, uh, a whole bunch happen in kind of the um, stress zone, if you will, and eventually a final rupture occurs. And but it was cracking all over the place before final rupture occurred, basically. And so this whitening is a craze crack formation. So strain whitening, fibrils. Um, this was answering the question, why does plastic turn white under stress? Okay, and so uh, it was very fitting, so I borrowed it from this, uh, this website. Couldn't make a good picture of my own, unfortunately. Uh, but again, anytime you look at a polymer and uh, you can actually take a plastic spoon, probably a black one would be better to see it. And uh, if, when you see that whitening occur, um, that's, that's strain whitening. And it's the formation of craze cracks. Um, here's another kind of really cool, excuse me, um, really cool, um, I guess, depiction of kind of craze cracks propagating through. And it kind of shows this crack tip propagation kind of moves through the material. This was a result of a kind of a double stress concentrator, right? So they did a saw cut, then they put, they call it a razor notch. I guess they cut it again. And uh, the crack propagates through the material based on this stress concentrator. And you kind of see these uh, craze cracks. This is really, really kind of cool. I like craze cracks if you, you haven't figured it out. Um, here's another um, example of craze cracks. And this is very similar to the uh, figure I showed up here. And so this one came out of our lab and uh, we've, we've yet to publish this work. Um, we're actually in progress. So um, maybe in later years when I show this video again, it'll be a published paper. Um, but anyway, so we see fibrils um, living in the crack and um, see it again in this other individual's article um, in a, <coughs> excuse me, um, this article here, excuse me, I threw myself off. And again, uh, you kind of see the fibrils form with a, with a fairly regular spacing. And uh, so fibril void here, well, I have to interpret the contrast, but it's telling me, so the, the darker spots, the void. And uh, really, really cool. Um, <clears throat> they apparently use atomic force microscopy to see their fibrils. And uh, this is an SEM image, and this is these are AFM images of, um, of the fibrils. I'm sorry, of the, um, yeah, fibrils within the, the craze cracks, basically. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool. I'm looking at a cyclic failure. So earlier in the lecture, I kind of showed uh, examples of different polymer morphologies. Um, I've harped a lot on um, ductile brittle. And uh, let's see what other kind of preview. Um, Demixing structures, interfaces. So we've seen interfaces, we've seen ductile brittle, and we've even seen secondary cracks. And now we're going to kind of look at this uh, dynamic loading uh, situation. So we see fatigue striations. And these are really nice, actually, uh, very evenly spaced. And uh, this is polycarbonate, which, uh, you know, actually fails brittle. And so this is a cyclic failure of polycarbonate. Um, if you go back and look at, at this, where did I show it? This one. This is not a cyclic failure of polycarbonate. This was a tensile test, so a, a dog bone. So we're looking at the fracture surface of a dog bone text, a tensile test specimen. Um, this is a fatigue specimen. And again, you see fatigue striations and uh, you can tell where the crack propagated, um, very similar to what we see in, in metal fatigue. And uh, so the crack propagated this way, or I should probably do it with the laser pointer this way. And uh, really kind of cool. So these are fatigue striations. Um, we kind of did our own ex experiment as well where we made these hinges. And um, this is actually PLA, uh, which isn't the most uh, ductile material, but we still see uh, fatigue striations here. This was a living hinge. And um, I've kind of I've kind of talked about living hinges before in this class uh, where it's it's not, um, you know, a mechanical structure. It's, it's basically like folding a piece of paper and um, you just use this one. It's like folding a piece of paper. So if I fold a piece of plastic, it's a living hinge basically. And um, so again, we see these uh, fatigue striations. The final rupture occurred in this, in this case in PLA in the middle of the, uh, of, in the middle of the hinge. 
And so it propagated going this way and it propagated going this way. And again, we see it's a little bit different than, than these here are fatigue striations, right? A little bit different, but this was a, a hinge, really kind of cool. Um, seeing it again in a different material. So this was nylon and uh, the failure actually occurred at the bottom of the hinge for this one. And uh, so we only have one uh, crack propagation or crack um, propagation direction, excuse me. Um, adding rubber to a material um, changes things. And so we've seen uh, the effect of adding rubber uh, to uh, you know, basically the failure mode, if you will, of, um, of ABS. And it kind of, once you get to the 50%, you're more rubber here, right? So these are probably the ones you want to compare a little bit more. And um, so 25% SEBS, very uh, dramatic difference in the, in the fracture surface morphology, um, as we see compared to just pure ABS. And a ductile, ductile, kind of see some brittle. Here, this is actually kind of cool. Um, ABS itself actually is rubber toughened. Uh, the, it's, a, it's styrene acrylonitrile with butadiene spheres in it. Um, but this is kind of showing they cut it here. And so you see the, they've put these rubber spheres um, in this epoxy. And then when they um, actually deformed it, um, you actually see the, the spheres deform themselves um, under, under a tensile load. And um, again, you know, they're dispersing rubber within the material. So you have kind of this two phase structure and uh, rubber generally um, leads to a toughening um, effect. So it's rubber toughening is, is what, you, what you tend to call it. Um, what's really happening now and you could kind of say um, this is a reason why the fibrils are bigger, uh, but you have these rubber particles and they're, they're kind of arresting the crack, right? But something's always going to, it's, it's going to eventually fail anyway. Okay. And so what ends up stretching is the rubber component of uh, your mixture, whether you have something like dispersed rubber spheroids in your, in your material or you have um, these rubberized blends, and I've shown the uh, microstructures in previous lectures. So if you want to kind of see the microstructure of these uh, ABS SEBS blends, um, I've shown that in the blends lecture, and I am a little remiss for not showing it here. Um, but here it, it's more of a two-phase system, so it's a little bit different than uh, this type of system. Excuse me, this type of system where you have these dispersed uh, spheroids of a uh, rubber. Um, but when you have these dispersed spheroids of rubber, um, they tend to arrest the crack. And instead of the material itself, the individual polymer chains uh, stretching um, during the formation of crazes, um, these rubber particles uh, tend to stretch and actually resist the overall failure of uh, your, your, your structure. And so that's kind of a mechanism for rubber toughening. It's, it's crack arresting um, in this case, okay. Um, Adding rubber basically meant to change the, uh, the, the fracture behavior. And this is very old. So people have been doing this for, for quite a while. Um, I won't talk too much about that. I don't think it really um, complements anything else. And it's kind of hard to see because you, know, you, you can't really see the two phases. They didn't do any staining or anything like that. But you kind of see these rubber particles are in, in the crack. So it's holding the material together. It's, it's preventing this material from reaching final rupture or delaying uh, final rupture, basically. Um, kind of other uh, fracture features uh, that we tend to see on uh, polymer structures. Um, and again, you know, I kind of did this old school. I did this cut and paste. I did it digitally, um, but I've been told that there is software that actually would have uh, allowed me to um, blend the contrast a little better. And uh, so I, I wrote this with a student, um, Angel Torado, or Angel Torado, Torado. and um, um, so taking the blame for the contrast because I, I put these these kind of big ones together. Um, but anywho, uh, when you see, and this is more planar than uh, than it looks because of the contrast, but this definitely is a ridge. And when you see these ridges pop up on uh, fracture surfaces, so here's one. And then here's another, uh, these are called cleavage stops. And so we kind of see there's a lot of uh, propagation directions here. These are like secondary 
propagation directions, but the overall direction of the crack propagation was going this way, and then it stopped, and then kept going this way, and then it stopped. So these are these are cleavage stops. So that's a fracture surface feature. I want to kind of draw your attention to that. Um, these next images come from this article that we put out. And uh, so what we did was we took two polyesters. So one was polylactic acid. Um, the other one was PET-G. So these are off the shelf uh, additive manufacturing uh, filaments, basically. And, um, and uh, we exposed them to different liquid media. And uh, this was all off the shelf. So uh, we exposed it to stuff like um, um, vinegar and, and coke and stuff like that. And it's a, it's a pretty good article. Um, I will probably post this on Blackboard as well if you want to have a look. Um, but I'll take, um, excuse me there, my phone was ringing. Um, the next images come from, from this article. So um, stress fields. So here's kind of another example of a stress field. And you can kind of almost see, so we had really good printing parameters when we printed this stuff. There's not many voids. Um, I've talked sometimes um, about the heat dissipating off the edges of a, of a 3D printed structure so you don't get the polymer diffusion. And so on the edges, we kind of see some voiding um, and we don't really see that in the interior, uh, depending on what this raster pattern was. This is actually the perimeter. So we, we printed with a perimeter. And if you're familiar with 3D printing, um, you, you know what, exactly what I'm talking about. If you're not familiar with 3D printing, um, I'll put it in really, really layman's terms. This pattern is not representative of the entire specimen, I think. Um, so there is a perimeter first, and then the, even if it was the same, it doesn't matter. Um, there's the perimeter first, and then it goes and fills in the interior. So it does the perimeter first. So if you print with a perimeter, you can kind of run into some problems like this. Um, but that's not the uh, full thing here. Uh, what we have, and you can kind of see traces of the layer here, and it extends in. So we see the trace of the layer here, and then we see there's some defect caused by the inner layer. So it's an inner layer defect um, led to the manifestation of a, of a, of a stress field. And again, pretty close to circular structure. And actually, we see kind of two intersecting stress fields uh, together, um, both caused by um, inner layer defects, basically, um, due to the printing process. Uh, mud cracking is uh, one that's uh, really kind of cool. Uh, mud cracking is actually caused by molecular damage. And uh, so uh, one thing I'll point out, um, this is a pet G. So this one was PLA. So you notice that it's, it's still pretty flat. There's not that much deformation um, due to the tensile test. Um, pet G, it's polyethylene tetraphthalate, so polyester, but it's uh, plasticized with, uh, with um, um, what's it plasticized with? What is the G? Glycol. And ethylene glycol, excuse me, had to remember. And you saw me uh, struggle to remember. Um, but ethylene glycol is a plasticizer, so it is a much more ductile material. So you see there's some necking occurring before final rupture, quite a bit of necking, actually. Um, this would have been a more rectangular looking structure. And uh, we see this interesting feature here. This is called mud cracking. And this mud cracking is uh, due to basically molecular breakdown, molecular damage. It's irreversible. And uh, so some molecular damage uh, to polymers is reversible. So if you've overexposed it to moisture, you can kind of bake it off and, um, and kind of heal your material, if you will. So you can, you can warm it up. And uh, different polymers, uh, depending on what they are, will even have uh, drying schedules. And, uh, and so you can kind of heal the material, remove the moisture, and uh, especially if you're gonna reprocess it, right? If you're going to uh, melt it again or injection mold it or whatever. Uh, but when you have stuff like this, like mud cracking, you've, you've severely damaged the material. And uh, this was due to apple, this was exposed to apple cider, apple cider vinegar. So it's actually kind of interesting um, because um, sometimes apple cider vinegar is sold in, in, um, in pet bottles, not pet G. So the plasticizing uh, seemingly made it more susceptible um, to degradation due to the exposure to apple cider vinegar. Um, but anyway, mud cracking. And I really like these features. I have a bigger one of the, of the same, um, a bigger image of the same feature. And you kind of see it's just flaking off. Um, you can really get, appreciate 
the damage that was done to the material uh, by exposing it to um, the liquid media it was exposed to, in this case, apple cider vinegar. Um, other things to kind of look at, again, this is Pet G. This was exposed to uh, Mexican Coke and um, very specific there. Um, a lot of plastic deformation occurred. And um, there's a, a other story, but I'll, I'll focus mostly on the um, on the the key um, uh, fracture surface I want to show, which is a sheer lip. So kind of this deformation at the end of uh, at the end of the failure or the final rupture uh, for at least this uh, crack interface, um, the sheer lip. And so that's another feature to look at. I didn't title the slide because I had it labeled on the on the picture. Um, this is another thing I kind of want to show. So this is PET-G again. You can tell a lot of plastic deformation, but this void here did not play a part in the uh, failure of this material, basically, is what I'm trying to show. And so not all defects in a polymer specimen um, play a role in the overall failure. And um, I've kind of argued this with people now and again, but this is due to viscoelastic flow. If it's big enough, okay, it'll it'll cause some problems, and we've seen that earlier in this lecture. Uh, so it's almost um, um, like a critical defect size uh, for a material. But viscoelastic flow kind of remedies the presence of defects in some cases, not always, but in some cases. And uh, this underwent a lot of plastic deformation before it failed. Um, but this void didn't really have much to do uh, with the overall failure, so the crack kind of propagated around it. And I have other examples and other papers um, that I can share with you if you're interested. Um, this is PLA, so again, a ductal, not a ductal failure, more of a brittle failure. Uh, this is a really good example of fibrils on uh, the fracture surface, and so um, they're kind of localized. The, the fibril layer areas are, are localized, but um, again, fibrils can occur, or fibrils do occur um, in, a, in kind of a brittle mode failure um, because the nature of the formation tracks uh, deals with fibrils, basically. And these are really long fibrils, so these polymer chains were really holding on for dear life as uh, this specimen was pulled to failure. And uh, here um, we also see kind of some strain. I think we see some, some stress filled formation. Yeah, we do. Some stress filled formation in there as well. Um, but the fibrils are the, are the big thing I wanted to kind of point out um, on, this, on this slide. And uh, with that, this is a good place to stop. Again, this was not meant to be a end all be all lecture on polymer failure analysis. Uh, but some key points I wanted to uh, really drive home differences between ductal and brittle failure modes, um, some fracture morphology associated with that, uh, the cause of, uh, of stress whitening or strain, strain whitening, excuse me, strain whitening. And, um, and I think it is stress whitening, excuse me. But anyway, the why, why plastic turns white when it's deformed, basically. It's, it's the formation of crazed cracks. I'm um, also show you some cyclic failure and uh, the effect of uh, molecular damage as we've seen with uh, mud cracking. Um, if you have any questions on this kind of stuff, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you very much for your time. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.